All right. Where do we go from here? I've been getting a lot of requests for videos on or updates on this car. Now, you probably remember back in uh, November 2014, I bought this car brand new. It's a 2014 Hyundai Elantra GT with the appearance package. Um, this is the mid-level trim for the GT. Uh, your base model is basically the same car, um, but it has cloth interior, 16-inch uh, alloys, and um, see. Oh yeah, uh, it does not have sport suspension. Now this being the mid-level, it has 17-inch uh, alloys, uh, leather interior, which is a perforated leather. Uh, sport suspension, which makes it a little bit tighter handling. And, um, yeah, six-speed automatic. Optional six-speed manual. And I've driven both, and I prefer the automatic, um, it, it, just because I drive so much. <laughs> so, there is one trim level above this uh, for the GT. It's the basically the same car with the tech package which includes a sunroof and navigation but it is essentially the same car in every other way what can I tell you about this car oh yes oh yes one more thing the um, the appearance package that I have uh, also includes the keyless ignition option proximity key the car has over 60,000 miles on it. It is not three years old yet. And um, what can I tell you? I mean, this is probably one of the nicest cars I've, I've ever owned. And I've owned better cars. I've owned worse cars. I, I love this car. This thing is so nice handling, um, so reliable. I commute a lot. I commute about 60 miles a day. That's round trip. I also use the car for work, which means that this car sees, a, sees stresses and abuses that most cars don't ever see. Um, I generally stop and start this car, and uh, the engine anyway, approximately 12 times a day in some cases. I mean, it can, it can be ridiculous. I'm always moving from one location to the next. I'm always transporting equipment. And that's why I bought the hatchback. And that decision worked out quite nicely, I'll tell you that. So, 60,000 miles on with my abuses, and also, <laughs> I also want to point this out too, I live on a mountain. So, I live in rural New Hampshire. I commute from where I live, about 30 miles south, every morning. And I go from like the city all the way into the countryside, up on a mountain. And a lot of my neighbors drive Subarus, SUVs, and, and similar vehicles. And here I am driving a sport hatchback. The reality is, you don't. You don't need four-wheel drive to drive in the snow. This car does it quite nicely. However, to make that possible, I have to install 15 inch steel rims with nice heavy duty snow tires. And that is how I'm able to get this car through even the toughest snowstorms without any problems. And I'm regularly passing trucks and SUVs that are upside down in the ditch because they don't know how to drive. Look, all wheel drive is great. It does make driving in the snow a lot easier, especially when you're climbing hills. And, and trust me, sometimes you need it when you climb hills. But it doesn't replace general driving skills. I've been commuting this trip, this, this, this uh, particular route, for 11 years. So I know what I'm doing. So how does that pertain to this car? Well, the thing is, for a car to be decent in snow, it needs to have adequate ground clearance and it needs to be able to, it, it needs to have um, decent weight distribution front to back. And you want a nice heavy drivetrain. That really, really helps. 
And this uh, this particular two liter four cylinder with a six speed automatic is just heavy enough to give me plenty of traction where I need it. And I've had cars that honestly didn't do so well. I had a 2007 Nissan Versa when I first moved out here. And uh, it was terrible, absolutely dreadful in snow, no matter what I did, snow tires notwithstanding. This car, I don't have that problem. And my previous car, the 2010 Elantra, also didn't have this problem. So moving along to general reliability. Now this car was built in the, uh, I believe the Ulsan South Korea plant, where they have pretty good, pretty good, uh, uh, quality control. I mean, I didn't have any issues with this car out the gate. Um, nothing wrong with it until until it was about a year and a half or two years old. And I started seeing issues. Um, for example, the evaporative emissions uh, purge valve had failed. Uh, and it, all it really did was trigger an engine light. There was no... I mean, when, the, when, the, when something like that goes, it doesn't usually affect drivability or performance. Um, and in this case, it certainly did not. Here, I'm accelerating. Anyway. <laughs> so, yeah. The purge valve, which is located in the front part of the engine compartment, right, actually, it's located next to the uh, intake manifold, so it's really easy to get to. Um, cost about 20 bucks to replace if you do it yourself, but it was covered under warranty, so it cost me nothing. And it was done in like 10 minutes. Another issue I had was a front right wheel bearing. Uh, and that started to go bad, and I thought it was tire noise. And I drove it like that for quite a while, thinking it was tire noise. It turns out it wasn't. It was a wheel bearing. And, um, and the dealer replaced it at no charge, uh, no questions, no and just yeah, bring it on in, fix it, done. It's been fine ever since. That's two warranty. It was a third warranty claim for a rear spoiler that was expanding in hot sun in the in the hot sun. So if I had the car parked, you know, in a parking lot without any shade, in a, in a, you know during a heat wave. The plastic on the spoiler would expand just enough to strike the roof uh, when I went to go open the hatch. So that was replaced at no charge, and uh, that was it. You know, this car hasn't had any major failures like my old car did. Before this, I had a 2010 Elantra that went through one, two, three transmissions, all for the same problem, for the same defect. And it was not a lack of maintenance, and it wasn't abuse. Um, so you know we can put that bet, put that to, re to to rest now, because the second, the third, the second transmission was at forty thousand. The first one was at sixteen, and the third one was at ninety. And that's when I got rid of the car. That's when I said enough is enough, and I bought this one. Let me tell you about the six-speed automatic that's in this car. Like the the four-speed automatic that was in my previous Elantra. The six-speed in this car was also designed and built by Hyundai's Mobis uh, division. And is it Mobis that builds their trans? I think it's Mobis that builds them. Uh, I think a lot of their uh, part suppliers are, are owned by an in-house company, Mobis. So, yeah, it was a Hyundai product. And, and just for a little background, a lot of automakers sub out their transmissions to other companies. Uh, for example, um, Zia Friedrichshafen and um, uh, Nissan partially owns Jatco, which is another auto, uh, transmission manufacturer. Then you've got Getrag out of Germany um, and Zia Friedrichshafen. They're also German, I believe. But Hyundai makes their own transmissions now. They used to be get, they used to buy them from Mitsubishi, and uh, now they're doing their own. So the six-speed transmission in this car is one of the best transmissions I have ever driven. It is smooth. It is prompt. It is. It just does what it's supposed to do, and it doesn't 
miss any... Sh I mean, I've had really, really dreadful experiences with automatics in my, in my life. And one of the worst ones I've ever driven was a Mazda... Well, actually, it was a Ford transmission um, in an old Mazda 626 that I had back, in the, back when I was in high school. And that transmission was a guaranteed to fail transmission. If you owned a Mazda 626 made between 1994 and 2002, it has the infamous LA4EL transmission or the CD4E. And yes, I owned one and it was the worst transmission ever. Um, the transmission fluid would turn black in 10,000 miles. I am not even kidding you. Anyway, let's let's stick to the topic at hand. This transmission, um, I did have it flushed at 30,000. It's due for its second flush because of the driving conditions I put it through. Um, but it is such a smooth, buttery, silky, uh, just, I can't even tell you how good it is. Um, just an amazing transmission. Uh, well engineered, well built. 60,000 miles on and it still performs like it did when I bought it. And that to me means more than anything Consumer Reports can ever tell you. So, I have driven the, the six speed manual version of this car. A friend of mine bought the exact same car with a manual. And that was the one that I was going to buy, but I decided against it because I just don't, I didn't want a manual at the time. And it worked out great because I needed to drive this car while recovering from a broken leg. And if I had a manual, I would not have been able to drive it at all. So <laughs> that kind of worked out in my favor. But the manual version, which I've driven, it's nice. I just don't like it. I, I You know, the gear ratios are... If I recall, they were very close together. I didn't like the clutch feel. It was like there was nothing there. There was no feedback to it. I stalled it like 10 times trying to get it out of the guy's driveway. And I'm like, yeah, I don't like this. And I've driven manuals before. I have no problem driving them. Um, but this one, I just it just didn't feel right to me. So I'm glad I bought the automatic. The automatic also has a feature that the manual does not called Active Eco. And Active Eco is a function that um, Active Eco is a function that changes the transmission's uh, shift timing and it makes it shift earlier. So it takes a lot of the fun out of driving the car. Um, it doesn't really put a dent in fuel economy. I had it on for a while and I noticed the car really didn't drive nicely, it shifted too soon, and um, it didn't, it was reluctant to downshift, I, I just didn't like it, it, it didn't really improve my mileage at all, so I turned that off uh, by default. It has adjustable power steering, and I've gotten used to that, I just wish it was automatic. So let me explain, now it has three settings for power steering assist, which is electric power steering, which is what most cars are now. Long are the days of having a, uh, a trans uh, power steering pump and all that crap. And um, let's see, put the slow down here. So speed limit drops precipitously right about where I am. <laughs> Got to be careful. Um, so yeah, the power steering um, has three assist settings, uh, basically sport, comfort, and normal. Now sport mode is really fun when you're on the highway especially, and you're not turning and, you know, at low speeds through parking lots. Sport mode lowers the power steering assist just enough to give you better road feel and um, it, it, it really helps prevent oversteering. Comfort mode is the polar opposite of that. It makes the car drive like a like an old Buick um, or a Camry, <laughs> and it just it over assists the steering wheel really badly. Um, it's just there's too much assist, and it doesn't. You have no road feel at all. 
Tom Hatton now normal mode is like Goldilocks. You know, when she found that 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 bed with the kid that had it and uh, the cub, whatever. Anyway, it's like Goldilocks mode. It's just right for all conditions. What it really needs, though, is an automatic mode, which allows the car to. It, it gives you the. Um, the boosted or the the higher amount of uh, steering assist at low speeds, while while gradually dropping it the faster you go. I wish it did that. It doesn't do that. I think some luxury cars have that function, and uh, now this one doesn't do that. So I'm I'm gonna ding it for that. Unfortunately, it's, it's so whatever Hyundai came up with, I I don't know. Anyway. The audio system is kind of a weak point uh, at this trim level. I don't have any experience with the upper trim level audio system uh, with the navigation built in, but I mean, it, it does the job. It sounds okay, but it lacks a certain level of punchiness that I would expect in a car in this, uh, in this segment. Um, it also has terrible iPod integration. It doesn't work the way I want it to. Let's just leave it at that. Um, the iPod integration, it, I really can't get into it in this video. It just, it lacks refinement. For example, when scrolling through songs on a list, which you should do while, while stopped, of course, you can't go from A to Z by rolling backwards. You have to scroll from A all the way to Z. And when you have an iPod with 20,000 songs on it, it takes some time. No, 20,000 20, hours, not 20,000 songs. But anyway, um, so yeah. So to combat that, I've actually pared down the list of stuff on my iPod, the one that I use in my car. And I have reduced the number of, of tracks uh, so that it doesn't take so damn long to scroll through the list. Otherwise, it sounds all right. I mean, it sounds okay. It does the job. I mean... You can always replace it. That is an option, and the replacement uh, or the universal audio system bracketeering that they sell for this car, I believe it includes controls for. It replaces most of the upper bezel in the dashboard. Everything the camera sees right now gets replaced. Um, but you lose a few things. Like, for example, you have a Bluetooth microphone in the headliner that won't be used anymore. You've got a um, an XM satellite radio. Um, antenna that won't be used and you've got steering wheel mounted controls that you need to buy an accessory for to use them I'm going to pull into this car wash bay and we'll get a good look at the car's exterior and I'll show you some stuff that's happened to it over the years but um, you know other than that the audio system is uh, it's alright I'll just leave it at that and it's alright um, I have I don't Look, I'm old. I'm 33. I'm not going to go out and blow a thousand bucks on an audio system for this car. It's just not going to happen, um, ever, unless it breaks. When it dies, well, then maybe we'll talk. Let's take a look at the car. Now, the engine is very loud. It's a 16 valve with rocker arms. Um, yeah rocker arms, <laughs> roller rocker arms, so they, a lot of complexity in that valve train, hydraulic lash, lash adjusters, rocker arms, the fuel pump is mounted right about here and runs off a square cam lobe, it's a fuel injected, direct injected uh, motor, the fuel pumps in these cars are very loud, that's just uh, nature of the beast, um, of course electronic throttle, tumble control variable and uh, so this valve right here this is your tumble control it's actually no what it actually is it may not be tumble control it's um it changes the uh, the runner length for depending on driving conditions it cuts off sections of the manifold during periods of uh, high acceleration I believe easy access to uh, the serpentine belt replacement What's interesting about this radiator is the coolant reservoir is actually built into the radiator itself. The 
it's not a separate bottle somewhere else. It's actually part of the, the um, did I say, I'm sorry, the, the fan shroud. It's part of the fan shroud. Which is unique. I've never seen that before. Must be a indeed thing. The uh, air box is right here. Easy to change the air filter there. Fuse box under hood is over there. Uh, battery is uh, easy to access if it needs to be replaced. And mine's getting up there in age, so it's probably going to need to be changed soon. There is no transmission dipstick on this car, unfortunately. It's part of that new trend of non-serviceability. So if you want the fluid changed or checked, you've got to bring it to a transmission shop or a dealer. One of the nice things about this car is the headlight bulbs are easy to change. Um, I mean, you can change them very, very easily. So here's your, your um, low beam, high beam over here. All you got to do is twist this cap off. Reach in there, pull the bulb out. No special tools needed, no, no skin knuckles. Real easy. I love that. ABS modules over there. Hard to get to, so if it ever needs to be replaced, good luck. Now these 17 inch wheels suck, especially if you curb them, because they're expensive to replace, expensive to repair. I curbed this wheel just the other day, unfortunately I was, the circumstances I don't want to discuss, but it was very maddening, but I, I, I actually curbed the damn wheel for the first time ever. I have a guy who can fix this, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to cost me. Uh, so these 17-inch wheels are quite awful because they, uh, the tire size is, is, is unique and um, like you can't really find snow tires at 50s without special ordering them. Sixty thousand miles later, and these shocks still hold. <laughs> I guess it's not an amazing achievement, but it's there. Um, I have carried a number of things in the back of this car, one of them being a 1964 Vespa uh, V90. It actually, the chassis actually fits in here without the wheels on it. Um, I, I'm not even joking, it actually fits an entire motor scooter in pieces, of course. Um, a five-drawer bureau fits nicely in the back of this car. I actually fit a disassembled uh, executive size desk back here. Um, the one that used to be up in my bedroom fit perfectly. Disassembled, of course. So that would be a flat pack desk that you would buy at like Ikea maybe or Office Max. Um, I have also fit a water heater back here. I mean, it's just um, a couple of HP LaserJet uh, 600 series printers in boxes. I think I had to fit four of them back here. Um, there is storage underneath this cargo mat. Um, there's also a parcel tray under there that was an option in this particular trim level. It gives you a, a styrofoam compartmentized tray back there. And there's storage on either side. I can fit this uh, my laundry detergent over here. I have to go to a laundry mat. And I've got some glass cleaner and uh, chamois over there. The other thing about this car is build quality. I mean, you close these doors, you know, it's like a bank vault. That's what you want to hear, you know. Now this is the factory roof rack, the optional one. Uh, this is made by Yakima, and this is the, um, the aero bar line, and you can actually buy accessories for these pretty easily. I use this to transport a kayak and uh, works nicely. I don't even have the kayak holder, I just throw it on upside down and strap it down, but not too bad. One of the gripes I have with this car is leather upholstery. I don't like leather. I mean, it's not bad, but I don't like it. So the leather, the seating surfaces are leather, the bolsters are vinyl, and the backings are all vinyl. Um, 
it's held up pretty well. I mean, again, 60,000 miles, and I get in and out of this car up to 12 times a day. So, you know, you gotta. I gotta say, it's it's holding up pretty nicely. It really is. What isn't holding up though is the steering wheel. The leather steering wheel is uh, starting to lose its its coating. And uh, what I'm going to probably end up doing is I'm going to buy a, a steering wheel for a lower spec version, like the non-leather version, <laughs> and do the old swaparoo. Um, or I could have this recovered, but I'm, I will probably get that fixed at some point. So to convert this to a uh, the, the, one of the nice things about this car, and that you don't always get in a hatchback, is you can, these seats fold flat, okay? It's an acrobatic effort, but it can be done. What you do is you unclip the cushion and push it forward and down. It's mounted on this, this little H-frame thing. This is, uh, this is definitely an afterthought, I'm sure. I believe this was a response to maybe an initial review of, of the Elantra GT, or I-30 as it's known. And they came up with this little, <laughs> this hokey mechanism. It does the job, but, you know, you see it for what it is. Then you pop, you got to take the, the, head, the headrest off. You got to take those off. Then you drop the seat forward, and you have a flat load surface. Now, this cargo liner thing is annoying. It really <laughs> is annoying. It's never in the right position. It doesn't stay it's kind of a pain in the ass. I wish it wasn't here, but it does a nice job of protecting the interior. I was just transporting a carload of used toner cartridges. One of them started leaking on the mat. Thank God. And I, I uh, once I unloaded the cartridges, I took this whole thing out and I pressure washed it with a car wash. Um, so yeah, I mean it does a, it does the job, but it's really annoying. The other side. I want to show you something that's pretty neat. Um, now, some cars, you have to pull the fuel tank down to replace the fuel pump or the fuel filter. This car actually has this little trap door here. I'm not gonna, but right there, if I, if I cut the, uh, the perforations on this, I can replace the, I can remove this cover here and have access to the uh, to the fuel tank, the sending unit, the pump, and the filter, all right there without dropping the tank. That's actually quite nice. Now, this is of course stuff that you want to think about if you're looking at a long-term ownership with a car, because you're going to need to do stuff like that as the car gets older. And of course, now this is standard, I believe, on all trim levels, the uh, rear armrest cup holder. And then you've got bottle holders in the doors, all four doors, which comes in handy. Whoops. This happened about three months after I bought the car. I was driving along, and there was an animal that had darted out in front of me on a back country road. Yeah, didn't end well. Um... <clears throat> Rather than spend money on a new bumper, I took some, uh, some metal bracketing and I riveted it to the inside of the bumper lip, which prevented the crack from getting any worse. Yeah, it looks kind of shitty, but you know what? It does the job, and <laughs> it saved me about 1500 bucks, or whatever, the, whatever a bumper costs. Um, as the car gets older, you know, I'm probably going to wind up keeping this one for a while, and that's the plan anyway. I want to keep it for a couple of years, at least 150 to 200,000 miles. You know, and maybe one, you know, once the car is paid off, I'll replace the bumper, which shouldn't be long, which shouldn't be long from now. I'm going to probably have the bumper replaced. I wanted to get the car. I wanted to get, give it a chance to. Uh, to wear the paint out a little bit, you know what I mean? I mean, why replace a perfectly good painted bumper if it's just cracked? It's just, it's just stupid. So I'm going to wait until it gets a little worn, and um, then I'll replace it. Maybe have the hood painted or something. 
uh, to match. But for the most part, it's a cosmetic issue that I don't really care about. One thing this car does not have, and that seems to be like every car I buy doesn't have this, but everyone else's cars do. There is no glove box light. I wish there was one. What it does have is a hair conditioning vent in the glove box, which is something that Volkswagen used to do. Maybe still does. I don't quite understand that, why it has that. Um, oh, yeah. And, of course, being a Hyundai, they, 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 they really load their cars up with unexpected extras. Like, for example, uh, driver's side vanity mirror and light, lighted vanity mirror. My parents bought on both sides, on both sides. Look at that, on both sides. Awesome. Now, my parents have a Chrysler 200, right? A Chrysler 200, they bought a brand new 2015 Chrysler 200. It's not the base model, it's the step above base. The car cost about as much as this one did. Maybe a little more. No, a little bit less maybe. But it doesn't have, it has the worst transmission I've ever experienced. It has the Chrysler 9-speed automatic. It has the worst transmission I've ever driven. I, I need to really emphasize that. When you open the door of my parents' Chrysler 200, it, uh, it binds up. And it's because when the, when the car was manufactured, like the, I, I believe the door frame was, was improperly, improperly stamped or something. And so there's some problems there, you know, and the dealer can't fix it. They don't know how. The only way to fix it, they say, is to send it to a body shop, which they're like, well, we're not going to do that. So, um, anyway, I love this car. And, and I'll tell you, it, it has plenty of passing power on the highway. I'm used to anemic four cylinders that have no power at all. But you take modern technology... You take modern technology... Oh, I want to show you guys something interesting. If For, for my technology-related viewers, I'm going to show you something pretty cool. There is still a Renegade Radio Shack out here. I'm in Hillsborough, New Hampshire. There is a Renegade Radio Shack. They're still in business. Here it is. Radio Shack. It's independently owned. And they are not going away. They're using the company name, they're selling whatever products they can get, and they're still alive and well. I call it the Renegade Radio Shack because they're keeping the dream alive. Thank you, Radio Shack. Uh, Hillsboro Radio Shack, Hillsboro, New Hampshire. Still in business, always will be, I hope. Um, I just, the only thing is, whenever I need to go here, or to come here, they're, they're, not, they're not open. <laughs> It's like they don't work my hours. <laughs> oh well. So, okay, let's talk about the engine now. This is a, uh, I, I, I talked a little bit about it when the hood was open. So it is a, the Hyundai New, that's N-U, that's the Greek letter N, I believe. Um, the Greek New uh, 2.0 gasoline direct injected engine with a lot of uh, low friction technologies included. One of them being the roller rocker uh, camshaft, um, yeah. <laughs> the rocker arms used in the in the um, the valve train. Um, that is something that I did not expect to see in a car like this. Honestly, I'm surprised. Um, and I've actually seen these engines open, and they really do have roller rocker arms. Just blows my mind. But anyway, uh, <laughs> just to reduce friction, it has variable valve timing on intake and exhaust. Um, it features, hold on, I'm going to, I'm going to get some, uh, hopefully the store is still open. I need to get a snack. I'm hungry. I'm going to get a snack. Hold on. Just be right back in just a minute. Red box. Because we haven't heard of Netflix, I guess. All right. I got some bread. Some iced coffee. Because it's 10.38 and I need coffee for some reason. And I got a bag of Gardettos uh, because, well, those are good. Anyway. Um, so, yeah, the engine. So, it's direct injected. Um, which allows the, uh, the ECU to time 
fuel delivery with utmost precision exactly when it needs to be delivered um, better atomization all that jargon anyway um, that coupled with variable valve timing allows Hyundai to squeeze 100 into 73 horsepower out of a 2 liter 4 cylinder motor the previous uh, workhorse engine that Hyundai had been using for, for nearly a decade or more, almost two decades, was the 2-liter Beta 2 or the Beta 1 engine. And that sucker puts out like 140 horsepower, drinks more fuel, and um, is generally lethargic in every aspect of engine design. Um, I know this because I owned one. And, you know... While the Beta 2 engine was incredibly reliable, pretty robust, it had no power at all in comparison, in comparison to this car, to this engine. So, using modern technology, lightweight materials, and just plain kick-ass engineering, I think they did a very nice job uh, designing the new family of engines uh, for their motor cars for the next decade or so. Add a turbocharger to the motor and you've got a screaming demon <laughs> by, by comparison. So this car does not have a turbocharger. I don't want a turbocharger. Um, that just adds a, a level of reliability, um, a possible reliability issues that I do not want on my daily driver. Now, if it was a weekend car, maybe. Yeah, sure, why not? Turbocharge all the things. but. This is my daily driver. I just wanted to run. That's all. The one problem with GDI motor is, and this is a known issue, I knew this problem going into buying this car, but I, I did it anyway, because after driving it and seeing how much power it had, I'm like, you know what? Who cares? Um, in a port-injected engine, Fuel is delivered behind the intake valves. So the fuel and the detergents in the fuel help keep the valve clean from the back. Keeps the intake passage clean, keeps the valve clean, everybody's happy. On a GDI engine, the fuel is delivered directly into the cylinder, next to the spark plug in some cases, or close to it. Why is this a problem? Well, a little thing called positive crank ventilation. Positive crank ventilation is a system that draws air from within the crankcase. It, it draws any, any air from, that builds up in the crankcase, any buildup of uh, gases, anything, draws it into the intake system. And it burns it as part of the emissions control measures put in place in as early as the 1970s, possibly 1960s. Now, why is this a problem? Because inside, in, in that stream of blow-by and, and combustion byproducts that ends up in the crankcase is um, unburned fuel, oil, vapor, and other unwanted things. And that gets deposited onto the back side of the intake valve. When that happens, it builds up and builds up and it bakes on. Normally on a port injected engine that gets washed away with every intake stroke, but not on a GDI engine. The other thing is um, EGR, exhaust gas or circulation. EGR is a system that takes out a portion of the exhaust and it reburns it by reintroducing it into the intake stream. I'm told, and I've been able to almost confirm this with utter certainty, that this car does not have an EGR system. The GDI Hyundai Motors deleted the DGR system because it was causing even, it was while well, they were able to make it unnecessary through better combustion controls, but it also would have created an even bigger problem with carbon buildup onto the intake valves. So 
no EGR to my knowledge and the PCV is the only concern. Now, how do you keep the engine clean in a system like that? Well, you've got to use an intake cleaning spray and they actually have, CRC has a formula that is designed, it's a highly concentrated detergent that is designed to remove baked on buildup on a GDI motor. What does this mean? You've got to clean your intake on a, on a regular basis. The manufacturer recommends every 20,000 miles. I'm saying every 10. I mean, it, it, it could be a serious problem. Now, when the car is out of warranty and paid off and everything and I no longer care about it, I'm gonna pull the intake manifold off and see how much buildup it has. Now, I have been cleaning it regularly every 20,000 miles. I had it do, I have it done at the dealership, so I don't have to get my hands dirty. But they charge a fortune. They charge $200 to clean the intake. That adds up really quickly. Um, I did it myself once using the CRC stuff. I don't know if it worked. So, you know, we'll see how it goes as the car gets older. As of right now, I don't have any symptoms of carbon buildup. Now, carbon buildup would exhibit, you would have symptoms of, um, that would manifest as misfiring, for example. You'd have a frequent misfiring issue. And by that point, the buildup is so great that you have to pull the head off the engine and have the valves cleaned. Yeah, I don't know if it has to be pulled completely apart. Somebody who is a mechanic who could probably confirm this, but they use walnut blasting to blast the valves clean. And you don't want to do that. This has happened to Volkswagen and Audi owners, and so I've read. Far as I know, nobody's having build-up issues on the GDI 2.0 new engines yet, to my knowledge. Haven't heard of it yet. These engines are still fairly new to the market. Remember, the 2.0-liter new engine, I believe, has only been used in the Elantra since 2014. It is now 2017. So, the 2013 GDI is a 1.8-liter, by the way. So, uh, But, yeah, this engine has only been in use for a couple of years. You know, when they hit 5, 7, 10 years of age, then you'll know. You'll, you'll definitely know at that point. But I don't have any, any, uh, any evidence yet to corroborate my statements with. Okay, so as we wind down our car review at 60,000 miles, I, I like to think that I put more into these videos than most people do. I talk about things as the owner of the car, as the original owner of the car. And I can tell you, after owning, this is my second Hyundai, the first one was a 2010, which was designed in 07. Hyundai has really, really, really come a long way since the Excel of 1993. I mean, this car, I mean, Hyundai is now way up there in initial reliability rankings. Um, they're, I believe they're jockeying for position with Toyota. While their cars are certainly not perfect, nobody, there's no automaker that is, except for Toyota maybe. And even Toyotas, I've heard of people having major problems with them, certain model years. The 2007 Camry, I believe, is one of the worst. You know, I know, I know someone who had a 2008 or 9 RAV4. He blew the engine in it when, um, immediately blew the engine after the water pump let go. And it was a low mileage engine. It only had like 40,000 miles on it. Blew the water pump. Engine instantly cooked. So, you know, Toyota's not perfect either. Nobody's perfect. You're, no matter what you buy, no matter who you buy it from, you're going to have problems. That's just how it works. Cars are complex machines. And there's a lot that goes into them now. More so than ever before. You know, there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of electronics that are made all over the world. So, you know, the, the automaker, their job is to select suppliers that meet or exceed their expectations at a price they're willing to pay. Now, what Hyundai did 
is they started making a lot of their own parts under the Mobis brand. Um, a lot of the parts on this car, filters and, uh, you know, brake pads and, in, I mean, entire subsystems, electronics, all say Hyundai Mobis, which is Hyundai's in-house supply company. They, they make everything for Hyundai. All the parts are made by that company. And, and there's a lot of Bosch in this car, too. The injectors and the fuel pump, those are all made by Bosch. But, um, but Hyundai, of course, specifies, you know, how those parts are to be made and with what duty cycle ratings and everything else that they're targeting. And it, it's a really com a manufacturing is a really complex beast. But what I'm trying to get down to is Hyundai has taken a step to further control the quality of, of their sub-assemblies and parts by making them in-house. So that way they have better control. They so once again, I want to drive home the point that Hyundai truly has come a long way uh, since the 1993 Excel that my grandmother once owned. That was the car I learned to drive a manual in, and man, was it terrible. But they're, all, they're over that now. They're building quality products at reasonable prices. We're not looking at bargain basement Yugo competitors anymore, at least not from Hyundai Kia. Now, when it comes to replacing this car, when the time comes, and I'll, I'll decide when the time is right. It may be soon, it may be late. I don't know. What would I replace it with? I have considered a few vehicles. Now, I'm actually looking at going into a small, compact SUV or crossover. A couple of vehicles that I've considered. The Subaru Forester, which is my number one choice. The Toyota RAV4. The... And I only say this because I drove one, a uh, co-worker, I actually just bought one, a Volkswagen Tiguan. Now, I like the Tiguan. It is a beautiful rig. Um, and he bought his in this orange sun glow color. It's absolutely amazing. The problem with the Tiguan is there is some, there is some, a lack of refinement in the interior, which I expect in the Subaru, but the Subaru costs less. The Tiguan is a little on the high price side for the one I would end up buying. Now, the Tiguan comes with Volkswagen's legendary uh, reputation, which which isn't that, well, <laughs> yeah, not so good. That's one of the biggest problems that I would have. And since I rack up miles like crazy, I don't think that would be a good choice for me. Now, if I drove, you know, 10, 15 miles, hell, even 20 miles a day, I'd be all over that thing, but not at 60 miles a day. And that's where the Subaru comes in. Low cost of ownership, low purchase price, even buying them new. And I know a lot of people who have them and love them. The Subaru, though, it feels quite tinny and cheap, but it's also cheap anyway. As for the Hyundai Tucson, uh, I, they have come a long way. Like I said, they make excellent products. They're innovative. Their design department is, is, is unreal these days. Their cars are styled absolutely amazingly nicely. But it's that dual-clutch transmission that really bothers me, and that is definitely a... Um, to me, that is, that is not something I would want. Dual-clutch transmissions are efficient, sure, but something about having two dry clutches automatically controlled by servos on a vehicle that is not designed to crawl through slow moving traffic really bothers me. And there's nothing you can do to prevent them from overheating in certain circumstances. Um, so that would, unfortunately, the that, that unit's off my list. Now... CBT transmissions, which are used in the Subaru Forester, you have an option of a, a six-speed manual and a CBT. I would choose the CBT, um, but I've also owned two of them in the past, and I didn't really hate them. You know, once you get over the unusual feeling of stopping, or stopping and starting in a CBT, and there is some weirdness to them. Believe me. 
it's not a problem to me. To me, it's not an issue. And, and Subaru CVTs are better than Nissan's Jatco CVTs. Um, people seem to be more... Uh, they like them a little bit more, I think. And uh, the satisfaction rate is, is a little bit higher overall. So that brings me to the... Um, the Toyota RAV4, I like the RAV4, I just don't like the styling. <laughs> and yes, I am that petty. But why do I want an SUV? I want more ground clearance. I want more cargo space. I do want all-wheel drive. It would certainly help in some parts of my commute that this car does struggle in. Even though I, I enjoy driving in, in, in the snow, just kidding, uh, an SUV or a compact SUV with all-wheel drive and snow tires uh, would be almost unstoppable uh, in, uh, in, in a bad storm. Even though I, that, that can, you can take that literally, I've actually, I actually watched in slow motion as a guy driving a Forester plowed into a snowbank descending a long hill. And that's a hill that I've descended many, many times on this car, well, <laughs> twice a day for 11 years. But in this car, it does it just fine, only because I take it slow and I know how to prevent my car from losing control. But this guy was going way too fast. No matter what you drive, you can't stop in the snow if you can't, uh, you know, if your tires aren't up to the, to, to the task or you're going too fast. So, that all having been said, I thank you all for your viewership, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see how this, where this takes us. Uh, this car is good for now. It's... Uh, had a problem with it, and uh, that's it. Thank you.